He didn't choose you and he didn't choose me because of anything we had to offer. He didn't choose us because of any goodness of our own. When no one would choose us, right? I mean, I just think about this in, in, in a personal way, you know, uh, being unathletic, I never got chosen for anything, right? And if you're the last person, ch person chosen, I've said this before, if you're the last person chosen, it's really not a choice, <laughs> right? You're kind of thrust upon the team. That's how I always felt. And so he comes to these scriptures and he, and he says, man, in Christ you were chosen and you were chosen before you could do anything, right? It, some of us think, well, if I could just do enough good things. I talked to somebody in the hospital when I had, uh, we had our accident and I was trying to be a blessing to this nurse who had scraped all the gravel out of my knee and, or at least she scraped it all. I hope she did. And, uh, and I said, oh, God bless you. And, you know, I just want you to know how much God loves you. And, and uh, because he has, he has everything for you. And she goes, well, I sure hope I can, I can be good enough to deserve that. And I thought, oh, no. How tragic. Why? Because the poor thing, you know, she's laboring and, and, and she's, she's living, you know, and doesn't know how much God deeply loves her. But there's the idea behind religion, right? That if we just do enough things, God will accept us. If we just do enough things, then God will receive us. If we just do enough, and he's trying to get us to see that before we could do anything, before we were formed in our mother's womb, he had a plan for us and he chose us in him before time he chose us when we wouldn't even choose us right I mean if you get a kind of a clear view of yourself it's not really pretty right I mean every once in a while we'll have these moments of clarity and we'll see how ugly we can be how weak we can be our failures pop up before us and we say like Job you know woe is me and that's a good place to come from every once in a while because when you look at yourself independent of God, man, you, you should come to that. Everyone should come to the same conclusion. Woe is me. And he chose us when we had nothing to offer him, when we had nothing to do, we had done no good thing. He chose us in him. He chose us at the very same time. And at the very same time, he gives us the choice. This is where the conflict seems to come in. He calls us to a life of receiving what he has done. We struggle over this seeming conflict between our human free choice and the sovereign election of God. And I know it's hard to understand that we are chosen by God, but at the same time, he appeals to every individual to receive him, to choose him. We choose him though, only because he first chose us. Look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our part simply is to come. When Jesus spoke those words, he was talking to very religious people. And they were all under the burden, a great yoke of religion. And he says, listen, come to me. But he doesn't force his love on us. And what does he choose for us? Try not to get fig lost trying to figure out all the uh, ideas of election. Uh, you, you'll never grab it. And if, you, if, and, and if you think you got it all figured out, you're probably wrong. Right? <laughs> Because how can these finite minds understand the infinite? But this is what I hope you'll do, that you'll rejoice in it. You're special to God. And then what does he choose for you? That we should be holy and blameless before him. At the end of verse number four, when they trans translated the, 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 the modern Bible, they put the first two words that look like it'd be in verse five, in love. And they kept it in verse number four. And I think the reason they did that is because they wanted us to understand that all of this flows from what? God's love for us. And what are you? You're holy. Now, if we were handing out like questionnaires, like questionnaires as you came in the auditorium and I gave you like four choices, four adjectives to describe you uh, and you had to choose one and then hand it back to me and holy was one of them. How many of you would have checked off holy? 
Bonnie would because she's going to teach a whole women's retreat on it, right? <laughs> she doesn't want to get fired. But, and a few of you realize that because you've heard me preach on this before. But most of the time, we don't feel holy, do we? So we don't see ourselves as holy. And if you buy the enemy's lie that you're less than holy, then all unholiness seems normal for you, doesn't it? Do you see that's why the enemy's always trying to come to you and get you to believe a lie? Because if he can get you to believe a lie, he can get you living a lie. But Paul says, listen, you were chosen in him. And the thing that you were chosen for was to be holy. Holiness has a, it, it, it's, it's not the idea that I, I'm flawless or I'm perfect. Because you think of sometimes, you know, we were talking about this in India and, and we're talking about holy people. You know, in India, all the holy people, they dress in funny clothes or hopefully they're wearing clothes, you know. Um, they have these different things and people say, oh, to be holy, you got to do this or you, gotta, you can't cut your hair or you got to do, you know, kind of crazy things. And, and we think even in American Christianity that holiness is something very different than God thinks of it. We think it's kind of based on the list of things that we don't do or the things that we do do. But, but he's not saying you're holy because you're flawless. He's not saying you're holy be, because you, you're always strong. You never mess up. He's saying you're holy because you're whole. It's the whole idea of wholeness. And where do we find wholeness? We find wholeness in Christ. He be takes us in and makes us his, his possession. So we are holy simply by the fact that we have become the possession of God. You may not feel that way, but that is truly who you are. To be holy and be blameless before him in love. Now think about this. Blameless? Like I don't even know you guys that well, but... That's not one of the adjectives I would have been checking off, right? <laughs> no. Uh, right? If you, if you live in relationship with any group of people, you're married, you have children, you, you, know, um, you know that life is full of these challenges, and uh, we spend a lot of our life trying to assign blame. Right? Uh, I, Vanessa and I had a, a motorcycle accident, and, you know, the, the first thing we wanted to do was to make sure that we established blame, and the blame goes to the deer. <laughs> it wasn't my fault, right? It wasn't because I was doing something stupid or I shouldn't have been doing, you know, and we do that. But, you know, and I'm joking because uh, it's called an accident for a reason, but don't we often, you have a traffic accident, what's your first preoccupation? Assigning blame. Now, if you're married, you probably don't know anything about what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? Because no one in this room who's married would ever try to get the other person to own responsibility for the conflict. Some of you are laughing, right? Because this is like absolutely ridiculous. This is what you do right after you say, I do. Right? The first thing that goes wrong, what do we do? It's your fault. Uh, what is that? Where it's assigning blame. You made me, right? Have you, none of you have ever done this? You made me, uh, you made me, you know, and I'm not going to go into it because my, I don't know, I just read this in books. <laughs> my spouse is here and it might be unsafe for me to be too transparent. <laughs> No, but we do, and why do we do it? And then, and then the enemy will send people into your life to attach blame to you. And listen, I'll tell you something, because I know this, because I have had people, uh, you know, who, who if you said uh, Tim Ekno, they would not say holy and blameless. They would assign to you all of the things that I'm doing wrong. But whose work are they doing? The enemy. Listen, friends, when you stand before the judge, have you ever stood before a judge? Like, I had this experience in my youth that I'm not really proud of, but it, it was so long ago. I don't even think it's on the records anymore. I hope it's not. I passed my background check at the church, so it can't be there. No, I actually, it turned out all right. So I'm standing before the judge, and that is, like, scary. And the reason it was scary was, I was guilty, <laughs> right? 
You know, I mean, the police didn't just find me on the street, arrest me, and say, you know, you look like a pretty good guy. Now, I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing, and I had to go before the judge, and I was so petrified, I peeled my fingernail off without realizing what I was doing. And then when he let me off, I was like, I hope, and then I go, ow. <laughs> Uh, I like, I hope I never have to stand before a judge again. But here's what I want you to, you have no fear of the judge. You don't have to change. Part, part of God, one of the functions that he does is he tells us that Jesus is going to be judged. But then when you stand before the judge, you don't have to have any anxiety. Why are you free from anxiety? Because he has decided based on his love that you are holy and blameless and you're only holy and blameless and you have the enemy can come to you with all kinds of facts to kind of prove that you're guilty but jesus is saying listen all of that has been paid for and i paid for it in advance that debt has been paid that debt has been satisfied he's chosen you to be his and he wants you to be in a relationship of intimacy and you know this from your own personal relationships that if you're trying to assign blame it robs intimacy of the relationship you know this as a spouse if you're going about trying to assign blame you don't have intimacy you rob us of intimacy. And why did Jesus go and have this plan for us before the foundation of the world was even established, had to plan that you would be blameless, holy and blameless before him? Why? So that you could walk in intimacy with your creator every moment of every day in all of your failures and all of your weaknesses. Before the judge, blameless. Before your Abba, blameless. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what's the only condition? If you're in Christ. He says, if you're in Christ, you are now a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He says, everything that you were is not who you are. <laughs> All of your failures don't determine your identity. He says, if you're in Christ, you're so hidden with him in his love that you have a whole new identity. Colossians 1.22 says, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Isn't that incredible? Look at that. What was your part in that? Wow, right? Because religion makes us think that I've got to do something to get there. And God's trying to get us established that this is who I've made you to be. Now live there. It's a very different approach. What do we do to obtain it all? No, we have it. And we have it through faith. Romans chapter number 10, verse 9 and 10 says, because... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, think about it, two aspects of it. With the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one, is conf con one confesses and is saved. He's saying, listen, this is available to everyone here. Everybody here. No one should go home from this place and wonder whether they're chosen. No one should go home wondering if they're holy or blameless. He's saying, listen, you receive holiness and blameless by simply receiving Jesus Christ. Will you believe in your heart that it's Jesus plus nothing and that equals everything? Will you believe that Jesus died to pay the price for all of your faults and all of your failures and all of your weakness? And he died, he was buried, and he rose to come and give you death. He says, will you confess with your mouth? He says, you have it. Oh, this is a beautiful thing to confess him, to pronounce, to be in agreement with him. 
Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you confessed him as your Lord? You say, well, I'm waiting till the appropriate time. Listen, the appropriate time is now. Today is the day of your salvation. Open your heart and receive it. And I hope that no one will go home questioning or doubting, but that you'll take ownership of it and realize, listen, in your own energy, in your own effort, through all the, the effort that you could muster, you could never make yourself holy and you could never make yourself blameless. You could never live beyond reproach because you know and I know none of us could. But what does that mean? We give thanks because we have a savior. And then look what he says. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? You're holy, you're blameless. If you add the Colossians parallel passage, he says you're above reproach. Now we look at it and we go, how could any of that be? If it's about you, it's impossible. But it's about Jesus. And about what he's done and how he's taken you and hidden them in himself. So no matter who accuses you, blameless, holy, above reproach. And then he says, and I've got something even more better. More better. I learned that word in Hawaii. <laughs> Not in school. But it fits, right? It gets more better and more better. Why? He says, sonship. Do you see, and he uses this word predestined, and sometimes that's a scary word to people, but don't let it. It means it's the predetermined plan of God. For what? That you would be a son. Isn't that wonderful news? That you and I, 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 I had somebody ask me, I thought it was interesting. They, I think they were kind of challenging the testimony of Christ, and they said, well, if what you say is true, then why did God, you know, create man and let them sin if he knew they were going to fall. And the only thing I can think of to answer that is because he had a better plan. As amazing and as wonderful as his creative working is, he had a better plan. Your sonship. And you and I, we were born in Adam, but we are reborn into Jesus Christ. He's, he offers us this salvation. He says, and now you're a son, and I have adopted you into the family. In Roman, in, in Roman culture, adoption was an amazing thing. When a person was adopted, they would take all the records and all the history of the person that was being adopted, and they would take it, and they would burn it. And that person would be received and have all the rights uh, privileges and responsibilities as a natural born son. Their old identity was simply passed away. It was gone. You could not go back and say, yeah, but. And most Christians I know, they live in that, yeah, but. They're always going back to their old identity as sinners. But he's saying, listen, I want you to take an identity that's firmly in your sonship. You are who God says you are. He gives us a new identity. We've left the old identity behind. We've changed names with our new identity. We're no longer sinners, but saints. We're no longer the children of wrath, but we are now the beloved of God. Your destiny is to experience what it is to be a child of the king. It kind of fits with your women's retreat because that's who you are. But I have this fear that many of us just don't confess it. My religious upbringing, we would confess our sins, right? Um, we would walk into a booth, and, um, and when I was going to school, we would, we would kind of come in. and we, I don't remember how often we did it. We probably should have done it more than we did. <laughs> but um, we would have these things, and we would, like you'd line up, and the priest was in the middle, and they had, that's back and they had a box and you'd walk in and, and um, you'd kneel down and you'd start your prayer and then the, the little screen would open up. Remember that, Lulu? <laughs> oh, I was always fearful. Like, you know, and you start rattling, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And you'd list off all, not all your sins. <laughs> because there were some that you were, you know, because like you open it up and he's like, is that you, Ekno? 
uh, maybe we'll leave a couple of them off, you know. Um, and then you get, kind of go out. And, and I got so used to it. And even in my, Christ, my evangelical Christianity, it was so much sin-centric that we were always focusing on confessing our sins. And I'm not telling you when you grieve the Holy Spirit not to confess, not to say the same thing that God says about it. Do it. But why don't we ever confess the truth? I expected more than that, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we confess the truth and what is the truth of you you see you let the enemy come at you and bring shame and guilt and condemnation for all the things that Jesus has already paid for and sometimes we even bring condemnation to others. We feel so much condemnation, we extend it to all the people we're in relationship to, and we think we need to do the work of the enemy, which is to bring accusations. But the accuser of the brethren doesn't need any help from you or me. But we need to come a people who regularly confess, yes, sins if we have struggles with them. But what would be, how would it be transforming in our lives if every morning we woke up and we confessed, Lord, I'm holy. I'm blameless. I'm your adopted son. As long as you go through life with a sin conscious mentality where your focus and identity is all about your sin, your sin is always gonna be normal. But if you started off every day and you said, Lord, I'm yours, and you've made me holy, and you've made me blameless. You put me above reproach, and I can stand before you in your love, and I'm your son. Wouldn't that change how you approached everything in life? I think it would shake, at least shake your head. So let's confess. Let's have, let's have open confession. See, I, I, I left Catholicism before this became popular. They had this thing where it became open confession. You had to sit across from him like, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, but will you confess with me? I don't want to know anything about any of your sins. Like TMI. <laughs> like I don't need to know, right? But will you confess that you're holy? Say it with me. I am holy. I am blameless. I stand before you in love. Confess it. Come on. And I'm your beloved son. Isn't that amazing? When I say it, it lifts my spirit. It reminds me. And you know, there, I don't have time to go into the sonship. The reason he didn't call you daughters isn't because he doesn't value daughters, but they didn't have the same inheritance rights. And what he wants you to realize, and we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, that you have the inheritance now. He calls you this. And, and Vic, skip to um, slide seven for me. And why did he do this? I love this. He says, according to the purpose of his will. Why did he do it? Because you were faithful in your tithing? Um, you were faithful in your devotions. You prayed an hour every day. You did one nice act of kindness to people randomly. Those are all good things, right? But what did you do? It? According to the purpose of whose will? His will. Isn't that beautiful? We have no reason to focus on ourselves. You hear me say from time to time on a fairly regular basis, it's Jesus plus nothing and that equals everything. But as soon as you enter into it, it really doesn't, it stops being good news. And you start to become a joyless. As soon as the focus turns on you, you're going to become joyless. He calls us to live in his will and his purposes. We are, the, we are all these things because it was the divine will of God. And he is so committed to our experience that he is going to work out the circumstances in our life and use them for the development of our good purpose. He will bring us to the end of our own resources so that we see him as the only viable resource. It's because of his will. And then for what purpose? To the praise of his glorious grace. You know, I don't, you know, I say I don't care. I do care, but 
I'm not going to let it change other people's opinions about grace change what I preach. Because when you realize it's grace in the beginning, it's grace in the middle, it's grace right to the very end, you and I need it. And what does grace cause in the heart of the one who's received it? Praise. Right? You get around a bunch of religious people who are self-righteous and think it's all about them and what they do. Do you hear genuine praise? No. Why? Because who's, who's the object? They are. And he's trying to get us to realize it's about him. And it's to the praise of his glorious grace. Grace, our being chosen in him, our holiness, our blamelessness, our adoption as sons works to the praise of his glorious grace. It always comes back to grace. If we focus on our own works and righteousness, we're going to struggle with praise because we think it's about us. But when we realize it's all Jesus, what can we do but sing out how great thou art? 2 Corinthians 4.15 says, for it, is all, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Do you see what grace does? It does the opposite of legalism. Legalism is man-centered, focuses on what man does and doesn't do, and man becomes filled with pride about his accomplishments and, and how he's doing, and there's always a comparison in legalism. And the comparison is never with the right person. I compare myself to Aaron. Aaron compares himself to, you know, Greg, and Greg compares himself to John. So we can always find someone, hopefully, that helps us look better. That's what legalism is all about. But if you take me apart from Christ, unhidden in Christ, and you compare me to Jesus, what can I say? And so he's, what is he saying? He says, stay hidden in, 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 in Christ and realize that grace works to increase thanksgiving. Because we know that we need it with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Some translations say, which have made us accepted in the beloved. How do you see yourself? We've talked about several kind of ways we need to describe ourselves. When I was talking with someone this weekend, I think, you know, what matters most? Your spouse's opinion your opinion, your neighbor's opinion, your kid's opinion, or God's opinion. Is that true? It's a hard place to come to, isn't it? Because we, I, I do. <laughs> I'm, you know, I value other people's opinion. But sometimes I have to kind of just put it all aside and say, listen, God's opinion in the end is all that matters. Right? It's hard, isn't it? Because we do, you know, the, some of us are more people pleaser types than others. But, um, you know, I, I kind of like, oh, I like people to have a good opinion of me. And then when they don't, I get all grieved because my focus is in the wrong spot. How are we going to live with joy? You let other people determine your acceptance and your blessings, you're going to be depressed. Right? Every once in a while, I find myself just so discouraged. People do that to you, right? <laughs> Maybe not even on purpose, but do you ever find yourself discouraged? You ever find yourself down and kind of in the dumps and, you know, even when, because it's Texas, it's not raining much, but it feels like there's a rain cloud over your head, right? And it just feels like, you know, it's just never going to be bright. And what's that all about? Your focus is wrong. You're cherishing and valuing the opinion of others more than the opinion of God. And that's a shame. Because you know what he says? You're accepted. You know what he says? You're beloved. And I just want each and every one of you to walk out of this place this morning and say, you know what? I'm his beloved. I'm his beloved. I don't think it's anything wrong with receiving love from other people. I mean, the church is all about loving each other. 
right? I mean, that's what he says. It's all about how we love one another. And we need to love one another. And we need to exercise and show and express love for one another. And when we get free from all our performing, we'll be free to love. But you got to take ownership that you are his beloved now. Not because of what you put in the offering plate, not because of how many people you witness to, not because of anything you do. You're his beloved because you are his possession. Would you choose to take ownership of this? Because I'm telling you, friends, life will throw rejection at you. Won't it? And we take ownership of that rejection and we live joyless. And he wants you to say, I'm accepted. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm blessed as his beloved. I am beloved. Why? Because of Jesus. Um, let's just go to the conclusion slide, Vic. I ask you again, will you confess with me? Right? If we had to confess our sins, I mean, that's probably a healthy thing to do sometimes to go to somebody and kind of confess what you struggle with. There's nothing wrong with that. But would you confess that you're holy and blameless? Would you say, you know, I'm going to start every day. I'm just going to confess. Right? There's something morbid about us. We don't mind confessing our sins because it makes us feel bad and it becomes very man-centered. But confess truth. Because I promise you, you walk out the door, the enemy is going to hit you with messages. And, you know, he will remind you of what you've done or what you thought. So you've got to confess, I am holy. And I'm blameless. And that changes how I live in the world. If I think I'm unholy and I'm full of blame, full of guilt and shame, and I carry it with me everywhere I go, Satan will use it to further enslave us. So you confess what the judge says is true. And as the judge, he has the right to determine. Nobody else can do that. And don't let anybody else tell you you're different than what God says is true of you. You are an adopted son. And your past is left behind. Everybody has a past. <laughs> Like, mine is so distant in the past, you know, but you see, Paul even said, you know, there's some things that we're ashamed of. And I bet everybody in here could go through and write a list of the things that you're kind of ashamed from. But is that where you're supposed to live? No, because in the adoption process, all of your past, all of your history, and it's checkered, Right? He says, take it in there, burn it. No one can get to it. It's gone. It's covered in the blood. You are now a son with all of the rights, all of the privileges, all of the responsibilities. You are now his beloved. I don't know, when I get overwhelmed by his love, I just feel like it needs to be expressed. If I get preoccupied with me, I'm, I usually go into a state of depression. But when I get focused on who he is and what he's done, I just want to be crazy generous. I want to bless him because it's really all about him. Father, thank you for your beloved. Speak deeply into our hearts and lives. Lord, we do now confess the truth that you made us holy. You made us blameless. You made us above reproach and that we can stand before you as sons, the beloved of God. Lord, I pray that we would never do the work of the accuser. But we would let the Spirit of God use us as a vessel to remind each other of who you say that we are. 
and work in your people. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here this morning, they're not sure that they're saved, that their sins have been forgiven, that heaven is their home, that you live in them now. I just pray right now they say, yes, Jesus. I believe that you died on that cross to pay for my sin. You were buried and you rose again to give me life. And I confess with my mouth, you Lord. Jesus, work in us.